And I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, presentation, demonstration, a little bit of everything tonight. So first, welcoming a lot of the students from RTA, from Humber, from York, from Centennial, anywhere else that I missed? No? Anyways, welcome to all of you, because this event really is all about you, the students. So welcome to the SIMT meeting. And uh, we have some really special guests for you today, but first to introduce everybody is our chair, our grand poobah, Tony Miracker. Thanks, everybody. Oh. Hello, Peter. One, two, three, four, five. I'm going back to Rick's mic. Hey, everybody. Yes, my name's Tony Miracker, and I'm uh, the chair for the section in Toronto. Um, I do want to acknowledge our sponsors for tonight. We have Let's To Go. Uh, Let's, go Let's Go Gaming. I knew that I'd mess that up. Dome Productions, William F. White, and SMPT TTC 2023, which will happen in June. So let's give a big round for everybody that <laughs> allowed the pizzas and the pop and the vegetables. Thanks to Sylvia to keep us healthy. Did we get cookies? Did that happen? No? Muffins. Cupcakes. Okay, so uh, I'm going to moderate this evening uh, just by uh, introducing everybody. Um, questions in-house, we're going to limit to about two or three, and then we'll have more question time at the end of all the presenters. And the guys that are in the virtual world, and I think there's supposed to be 64 people out there, um, use the question box to get us uh, access to our questions, or we'll get access to your questions. And there's no breaks between no breaks between presentations. So as Rick said, we've got some presenters tonight. We have Rich Richard, I call him. We have Ian Mc Mac McKinnis, Salah Goptu, and Mary Ellen Carlisle. Dome Productions from the rear. Waveform next up, let's do good gaming and Rick is from Toronto Metropolitan University, AKO the other name with an R. Okay, I just want to take a couple minutes and talk about SMPT. If everybody's not heard about SMPT, SMPT stands for Society of Motion Picture Television and Engineers. It's kind of an old name. The, the uh, society has been around for a hundred plus years, um, but it's 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 a organization. It's global. It's volunteer driven. We're all volunteers doing this. Uh, our game is to, uh, or our goal is to educate everybody, and especially the younger crowd, because we're all getting older. And uh, like I said, 1916 was when it was. Uh, was started and the mission stable statement is enabling the technical framework and global professional community that makes motion picture television and television and professional media available for all humanity to enjoy the artistic educational and social purposes that's the mouthful we're going to show you a small video six minutes long but i'm going to i'm going to be bad because i always sit through credits when we go see the movies but I'm going to bump out of the credits because we are time sensitive here. So I'm going to just hopefully hit that.
like to call myself an engineer and explainer. And uh, in this truck, I am the engineer in charge of the Metropolitan Opera Live in HD, which is transmitted uh, live to movie theaters around the world. Today we think of movies as being the giant screen and television being the little screen, but the first Edison movies were little screen. It was individual viewing into a kinetograph. I think it was pretty obvious that film uh, was a way to document what was going on, was a way to analyze what was happening as a war was approaching. Well, how can you do this when you go out with one camera and shoot a scene, I go out with another camera, shoot the same th scene, come back, splice those two things together, and it won't work because our standards are different. Hubbard, who was Secretary of the Standards Committee, the Government Standards Committee at the time said, either you get it together and develop common standards, or the government will adopt common standards. Jenkins was afraid, and they were all afraid a little bit. If we get together and start sharing these ideas, what's gonna happen to my own ideas? So he called a very small group of people together, and they met, and SEMTI was organized. So SEMPTI is um, a professional membership association bringing people together who are interested in this technology and, and want to see it advance. But it's also very important in setting standards for the industry to, uh, to enable interoperability along the workflow of the, the systems from camera acquisition to display. I think our challenge is to remain relevant into this new world that is primarily internet driven um, and to continue to be the place where people turn to for this technical knowledge and information. I'm not a technology guy, but going to film school and everything, I, I knew animation, I knew uh, visual effects, I knew, you know, camera. I, I knew all the technology involved in making movies at that time. So I took the money that I made from American Graffiti and we built up a, a small visual effects facility to try to figure out how to actually accomplish these shots. And in the end what we did do, the Dykes Reflex, was build a camera that is as precision as an animation camera, but it's designed to shoot models instead of something on a flat plane. And it was a lot of work, a lot of investment. John's invention of the Dykstra effects made the film work. If that, without that, I don't know what I'd have done. And that's a wrap on everybody else. That was a few years ago. Uh, Barbara is no longer executive uh, uh, at SIMTI. Uh, anyway, so SIMTI, what is it? They've won one Oscar, nine Emmys for standards, over 823 published standards. Everybody heard of SIMTI time code? Yes, SIMTI color bars. That's all part of the, the, the standard. Uh, and there's uh, 23, over 23,000 uh, journal articles. And they come once a month for a better part of eight months out of the year. And um, it, the good reading. So membership, globally 5,025. That has shrunk over the last uh, couple of years. COVID had a lot to do with that. There's over 30 sections, 37 are outside, percent, are outside of North America, and 6% make up the student body as members. Here in Canada, Toronto, and the Western Canada, Vancouver is a subsection of Toronto, 297 members, 17 student members, and Montreal, as we have two sections in Canada, uh, they also have a subsection in Ottawa, 179 members and three students on their on that side. So 
in the US, and uh, we have thought about doing this up here, but it uh, takes a little bit of organizing, but we'd love to do it. Um, these are student chapters. They're run by the students, they are attended by students, and they're at the university or colleges, i.e. Hollywood has six of them. Germany has three. Uh, another one, I think New York has six as well. They've just got the, the masses that, that uh, can execute that. So this is just a partial laundry list of uh, corporations that uh, are members. Um, some of them are recognizable, AVID, uh, Major League Baseball, and there's quite a few Canadians up there. Everts, Ross is up there, uh, Applied Electronics is up there, CBC. And there's a full list. If you go to the website, you can see all of the various diamonds and that level. But there's, that's the, the good thing about this is that they're involved in SIMPTI. They're looking for standards to be uh, administered because they are doing facilities uh, documentation. They want to make sure that they are in the standards, proper standards, i.e. like Everts and Ross, who are equipment manufacturers. They want to make sure that they adhere to time code standards and things of that nature or uh, uh, SIMPTI 2110. So we have meetings once a month, just to give you an example. Uh, January last year, we had in um, virtually, we didn't start back to in-person until September of this year, or last year, uh, which was at Humber College. Uh, remote production workflows. Uh, in March, we had uh, more threads about virtual production. And I think I have a couple of other slides here that uh, NEB wrap up. And if I'm not mistaken, isn't Gord Beard a Ryerson student? I think he is. He went to uh, NEB last year as part of your uh, uh, student uh, contingent that went down, and he sat on the panel and said his thoughts on what he felt NEB meant to him and, and things of that nature, which is all good information. Uh, large format acquisition was in June. And, and what SIMPTI is all about as well is they, they want to make sure that they are at the forefront of anything that's happening so that they can get involved in the standard side. Uh, media in the cloud, esports, pro AV, uh, all likewise in the uh, virtual production, volumetric uh, capturing, uh, immersive audio, in-camera visual effects. Now, this is, this is the slide that I want you guys to take away. Um, why SIMPTI? Why? And I noticed that uh, there's 106 of you that have signed up for the free membership for the first year, which is unbelievable. So run with it. And the reason why I want you to run with it is because it's people, it's enhancing your career, it's recognition and it's knowledge. Uh, people, it's global. Once you get into the database and you start seeing who's there, then you have an opportunity to poke them and say, hey, what do you think? Or I'm a student in Toronto. People will listen. We are, we've got a lot of wealth in, in uh, knowledge. We want to share it with you guys. So just engage us. Uh, enhance your career. Again, knowledge, networking. Uh, hopefully you're able to network with some of the people uh, outside, all you know, the members and also non-members. Recognition. Simply on your uh, resume likely is going to mean something to somebody that is like myself, who's a chairperson going like, hey, that's a SIMPTI member. And they're looking for a job. They're looking for information. Uh, three, three months ago, um, I knew of a post-production facility that was looking, and I knew that uh, uh, Loyalist College has uh, had a program. And I asked if there's still somebody available, and there was. And I connected the two, and now he's gainfully employed. So we can, we can help you out there. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then knowledge. Again, it's, it's all about gaining and taking in as much information as, as you can. Like the, the fact that, that Dome brought their mobile here 
and hopefully you've all got in to see it. That's how I started my career many, many, many years ago. I'm not telling you how many, but um, it was a good gig. Got to run a truck, got to go all over the country and, and meet a lot of people and you get to do Miss Universe, golf tournaments, uh, yeah, it's cool. Okay, that's it for me. I'll be back at the end of the show, but I'll be back introducing people. So Richard is our first uh, presenter tonight. And uh, Richard's bio reads, or Orion Enemy and CBIE International Education Awards winning Rick Grunberg has been a key member of in the ec educational community and production industry as a technical producer and consultant, director of photography and lighting director, i.e. he turned the lights down, um, <laughs> for the past 30 years. Okay, now you're showing your age. Okay. Um, he was a well, sorry, he, yes, he was a well, as, as well, a founding partner of one of Canada's most successful television facility and production company. I'm racking my brain. Uh, currently, I'll tell you what, Oasis. Oh, nice. Um, currently, Rick is a full-time faculty member at RTA School of Media at the TMU. I'll short form it. Rick, it's, uh, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. So uh, I'm here to speak to you today. Let's see if this other microphone works. I can shut off. Okay, perfect. I can use the technology. Yay. So uh, I'm here to talk to you today about virtual production. Uh, sort of, it, it's a new mode, although really not a new mode of production. I'm sure you've heard about it all over the place in terms of LED volumes. Uh, the new age of green screen, you've heard the word unreal many times, I'm sure, lately. So sort of combining all these softwares, hardwares, technologies, um, it's become a really a real growing industry, as I'm sure you're all aware, and people are looking for people. So let's have a look at a little bit about virtual production. So this is how far back I go. So Tony was laughing when I said 30 years, but if anybody remembers Thomas the Tank, Shining Time Station, this was virtual production in my day, <laughs> green screen, and we did some pretty magical things with it. You know, we, here we have George Carlin, we have Ringo, these are all sort of, they have foreground, they have background, these are all kind of magical things that we did to create some really, really wonderful product for, in this case, children. So. I go back to uh, in virtual production a long, long time. Um, and then there sort of, there came the new age of virtual production. And um, I was involved with uh, TFO, uh, the French sort of provincial network here. And they created the world's first, let me get it right, virtual live multi-camera virtual production system using Unreal. And it was the first, it sort of was a, a real pioneer in the industry. It was geared towards broadcast more so than film production, but uh, it also allowed for some really cool things like interactivity with some virtual objects. And this was quite a number of years ago. So we started doing a few projects, which I'll be showing you. Um, and I did a lot of lighting for it, a little bit of technology. We integrated it with a system called Black Tracks. So you could actually track uh, track the talent, track other objects on set. And we came up with some really interesting strategies for lighting virtual talent and, uh, and objects in, in, in a green screen space. So the interesting thing about um, the new systems of sort of virtual production, they're photorealistic. If you've watched The Mandalorian, if anybody's seen The Mandalorian, it backgrounds look and foregrounds that are generated virtually look real. Uh, the dynamic shadows, realistic reflections, a lot of animated elements that you could throw in, throw in there. There's interactivity with virtual objects that we were playing with, as I said. And it really did transform the economics. For instance, at TFO, 
they had a lot of content to produce in a very short amount of time. And as we've learned here at, at right, sorry, TMU in, uh, in RTA School of Media, we, you know, we have sets that we have to build and it takes a long time and they don't typically look very professional grade. Nowadays with the Unreal and the, with Unreal and the marketplace, you can get some really ph phenomenal stuff as foreground and background that you could bring into your show and you could change over like this. Uh, something we can't really do with standard production sets. Um, it's easily again that you could do 360 degree camera i'll show you some examples of that there's some need but not much need for post-production there's a lot more need for pre-production in terms of planning and designing the sets and virtual environments that you're actually working in and other great thing is it can be completely live the system we were working with for live broadcast and of course it can be multi-camera at least in the broadcast world uh, the industry itself, you know, we've been approached by Netflix, Disney, Universal, CBS, Amazon, they're all creating content now which needs people that understand this space, that understand how to work in Unreal, that understand how to work as a crew person on a set working in a virtual environment, that understand all the protocols involved, the software, so a lot of things that have to be sort of uh, developed or taught and learned and they need these people. Um, so we as educators, me as a faculty member in the RTA School of Media, you know, we really have to work hard and push uh, to make virtual a really large a component of the systems that we're, uh, that we're teaching at, in media colleges and universities. Um, it's, oh, I went too far. No, go back. Okay, so the first thing that caught me in this virtual space is, and hopefully this will play, was uh, a number of years ago when we first brought the system in as a lighting person, this was really something cool to watch. Let's see if it does play properly. Is it going to play? There you go. Oh. Jeffy? Yes. Léa Patrick Ah ma vieille tante Ah c'est drôle qu'on se voit aujourd'hui parce que l'autre jour j'ai croisé... Euh, te rappelles-tu de Simon Simon Tu sais Simon là, euh, en histoire secondaire 4... Oui Bon c'est ça, fait que là now you'll, now you'll see the real space. Café Non, non, merci. Léa Patrick <laughs> And if you look at the reflections, if you look at... Some really cool stuff. That wasn't the one video I wanted to show you, but let's see if it'll play. That was a pretty cool one, nonetheless. Let's see if this one will play. I think it will. So this was the first lighting test I did. And if you look at the background, is it going to play? No. It's not playing. Oh, there we go. Okay. So look at the uh, light coming from that window in the background. And I saw the talent walk through it and I went, oh, he's cutting a virtual beam of light. And to me as a lighting person that was like, okay, this is it. <laughs> this is where I want to be. So really, really some interesting stuff and developments. Um, and ever since then, I've been working in that space. And as, uh, as some people here know, I've been going down to NAB and, and lighting and working in a lot of people's booths uh, on the floor to make them look good and make them sort of the traditional even flat kind of lighting that we think green screen needs. Now we did this already. Um, so the way that this system works at least is there are trackers all in the space. Oop. There are trackers in the space. So you could see them up on the ceiling and the cameras basically are lined up to the actual environment at first, and then basically can actually track the movement of the cameras. Now this is done in the film world as well as it is in the, in the video world using different systems. And the neat thing with this system is with the zero density system and MOSIS and Stipe that's been used in this environment is we've got a jib there, we've got three cameras, all of those systems are tracked, and we can cut between any of them live and the way it works is you have one computer per camera basically generating these backgrounds that we cut to. 
So when we cut on a switcher between cameras, we're not actually cutting between cameras, we're cutting between computers that are generating all these foregrounds and backgrounds live. Okay, and we basically, as you saw in that diner set, we define what the action area is, and everything in front of that is foreground and everything behind that is background. And we do the same with the black track system that's tracking sort of the talent as well. Um, traditional, everybody here knows chroma key, yes? I'm sure everybody does. So traditional chroma key had all kinds of problems. I've worked for many years with that. And even Ultimat and couldn't really do fine hairs very well, couldn't do uh, bottles of clear liquid kind of thing. Uh, there were all kinds of issues about lighting it perfectly evenly in the background and then if you throw light on the foreground it really messes up the background because you can't really add color you can't there's a lot you can't do with traditional chroma key uh, in this system in the zero density system you actually define the action area you tell it this is the wall this is where we sort of the background is and you sort of sample shall we say the background space all around it and it therefore knows which is background and which is foreground. Uh, and you could see we can do some really interesting things here, like put the subject and all that stuff is in the foreground, those wires, the ropes in the foreground, and which are in the background. The system knows where those things are and where to place those virtual objects. Uh, the other cool thing is, no, look at this. Any, anybody ever tried keying green on top of green? How does that work? <laughs> does not work very well. So we were keying green on green and blue on blue. Now I actually cheated here because in the system, it actually created a black mask and I insert, reinserted the color back into it, but you could do those kinds of things. So, and in terms of lighting and interactivity, I'm gonna show you this little demo here. We were talking about how everything had to be very flatly lit in the old days. Well, have a look at this and no color and no, Let's see if this plays well. We've been waiting for you. Now this is very old graphics. Flexibility, right at the tips of your fingers. Technology so advanced that we are now limited only by our creativity. Let's make something extraordinary. So now obviously the backgrounds look much more photorealistic but it's quite remarkable. We were trying to show how dynamic and what you could do with the system. And how many, only three edits, actually two or three edits in that whole thing. Everything else is pretty much live. The walking through the water, the, so just to take you through it a little bit. And I had almost no lights on the green screen. This isn't the actual green screen. So I could actually color and throw light on the subject. And it was quite amazing when we just sort of dropped the lights on the background, something I'd never do in a traditional chroma key or a matte set. And I could light my subject as a lighting person. This was like, ooh, another great thing. I could actually create some character on my subject, not just have a flat look on a green screen. Um, we can use the jib and we were able to really get big, the, the studio is small, much smaller than this space and we were able to get pretty far back. So we could virtually sort of go well beyond the studio space in a jib type shot. Some really interesting stuff that we could do. There was a tracker in the boot in this case and Zero Density has recently updated their software. They have a new system, oh, I forgot what the new system's called, but it has its own built-in tracking system. But in this case, we were able to put the tracker in the boot. So when she stepped in the water, it actually rippled the water. The uh, orbs, the globes that you see there, was also affected as the person walks through it. I don't know if you saw, but they actually moved around the subject. And when she touched the orb, that was actually, there was a tracker in 
her hand as well. So she touched the orb, then move away. You could hold a virtual bottle of water kind of thing. Some really, really innovative stuff we were able to do. And this was quite a number of years ago. So things have progressed well beyond that now. And lastly, in terms of lighting, there was some virtual lighting. The actual virtual objects can cast light on your subject, only a 2D plane. So it doesn't really look that realistic all the time. But what I did is I put little holes in a, in a gobo pattern in a ellipsoidal light and panned it by her at the same time just to add a little bit more realism to it. So a little bit of real lighting and a little bit of virtual lighting. And <clears throat> so everybody asks now, like, what's the difference between the green screen that I'm talking about here and what do you see traditionally used more and more so in film? <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's have a little look at this. Some of you may have seen this. Reset. <clears throat> no matter what the project is, the creatives always want to see the closest representation to the final product as early on in the creative process. When I first walked on the set and the wall was up and we started to look through the camera, it, it started to feel like I was just filming in this actual location. We can track a camera's position in space in real time and render its perspective so that we can compellingly convince a camera that something else is happening in front of it that really isn't there. The thing to keep in mind is that the 3D world that you see on the wall is also a 3D scene that you can manipulate in a real engine. So this gives the filmmakers full flexibility to make any change they want to the scene live. So it's really exciting to see that we can, you know, use the real time lighting to not only change the environments virtually, but also have it affect the onset lighting as well. This opens up kind of like a virtual playground to shoot in. We've tried to expand the engine to be a very collaborative platform. So the director of photography, the director, they can all go into the scene and make modifications as they wish, as opposed to waiting for months and months. In this new frontier of virtual production, the filmmaker is more grounded into the scene that they're shooting, into the story they're trying to tell because you can interactively change the world, it, it brings all of those departments together because each one of them has a role in how this world is portrayed at some point along in the production. It's, uh, it's been my dream to get computer graphics to the point that they're totally for real. And I've loved video games and movies all my life, and this is bringing the best of them together. So this is what a lot of people nowadays are talking about, especially in the film world. Uh, but so this is a volume that uh, that I was on recently over at uh, some of the studios here. There, there's still their advantages and their specific uses for LED volumes works. You can avoid green spill. You get lighting. You actually can cast lighting from the green, the screens, the virtual LED walls that are behind and around the subject. There's still issues with that that we've been working out, but you can do that. And the performers can actually, rather than just staring at a green screen, they could actually interact with and see what's happening in the background. Uh, it's a very immersive experience. The limitations are they're less cost effective. These walls are tremendously, tremendously expensive, as, as we've discovered in trying to even bring in some walls in this space. Uh, there are artifacts that you get when sort of mo doing movement uh, with a camera. Uh, depending on the shots and the angles. You can't currently do live multi-camera. That's something we're playing with and experimenting with, or at least I have been, in terms of you can't have three or four cameras shooting on the same LED wall behind, because what do you do when three cameras are shooting the same scene? How do they each see something different on the wall? So doesn't really work in our live broadcast multi-camera space. Uh, so green screen still has its relevance. As you saw before, you can still do some really remarkable things on, on a green screen environment for live broadcast. Other things you can do, there's a lot of companies sort of throwing, you could augmented reality, you could have subjects that are sort of foreground, background that you're interacting with that are animated, that are thrown into your scene. Um, the main thing is though, 
especially for people starting off learning to use the software, learning Unreal as we're doing here at, uh, in, in the RTA School of Media. We have a few courses that have been run sort of teaching people how to use the software. It's also about uh, the, there's still the same market space for both LED volumes as well as working in, in the green screen space. And there's some similar onset crewing language between the two. Um, there are many different forms of sort of working in, in the LED volume and green screen space, starting from very simplistic. There are all kinds of simple, inexpensive tracking systems you can get, tracking sort of uh, live cameras, adding the backgrounds to it. Uh, one of the systems we've been looking at here, either a PTZ or a pan tilt, one of those cheapy cameras that still produce some pretty amazing quality here. So this is one of the systems we were looking to introduce with zero density uh, and or sort of the next level up, three broadcast cameras, each one with its own engine. Uh, basically, again, so each you, when you take a camera on a switcher, you're actually taking the engine, which has all the software development in it. And you can actually you're basically taking foreground, background and the camera all mixed together through the CPU that's there. So there are many different scales that you could work at different levels from very basic. We have some students working with, very, with, with phones and tracking systems, with very simple cameras. And sort of, it's really about understanding how, the software, the hardware, how to work on set with people. Um, Chris, uh, Chris Alexander is our sort of guru of Unreal here in the RTA School of Media, one of the top gamers, I think, in. Am I right, Jeff, in North America? He's a 17th Worldwide Street Fighter. There you go, 17th Worldwide in Street Fighter Third, Street Fighter Third Strike. There you go. Uh, and now is, is being certified as an uh, Unreal certified instructor. So it's about having the right people. This is our Red Bull Gaming Hub, correct? Uh, and there we're sort of learning. It's hands-on learning how to develop uh, Unreal for, for the gaming space as well as I guess it'll work in virtual production as well, same, same software. So it really is about learning the technologies, being able to build 3D assets, basic cinematics, and learning the aesthetics, the creative behind it all. Um, so it's really all about you folks getting into this space. The industry needs people that understands this. Uh, it needs people that understands not just that are creative, but that understands the technology and how to actually work on set with it. So hopefully that's where we plan on getting our students. And I hope all of the students here are sort of have somebody in working in that space. I know Humber, I think, has a good, who hears from Humber? One person, a few. I think you have a system already. Do you have, do you have already? A... Yeah, do you? It doesn't matter the level. If you're learning how to use it, if you're learning the protocols, that's what it's really all about. So hopefully you'll all be in this space or learning about this space sometime soon. And I thank you all very much for uh, letting me present to you today about virtual production. Thank you, Tony. For you. Thank you, Tony. Thanks thank you. very much. Thank you. I'll grab my water. We're gonna try and, is this three again? One, two, three, yes. Thank you, Rick. Next up is Ian McInnes. Uh, if Ian, yes, there you are. If, do you want a podium or you want a stick mic? Uh, I'll take podium, sure. Okay, cool, Alrighty. So Ian's the founder and president of Let's Go Gaming Incorporating, a corporation, a, a cloud enabled managed service company focused on providing professional production tools to a broad range of content creators. As an avid video gamer, he has keen interest on all forms of esports. As to the father of a young son, he's interested in creating safe space gaming environment for all the young gamers, modeling and traditional youth sports leagues. A Sheraton grad. There you go. So I'm gonna uh, move aside and there you are. Thank you.
Yeah. Are sick. Yeah. All right. Cool. So thank you all for coming slash listening to me talk. This is a fun thing for me to do. I've never done it in person. Uh, Let's Go Gaming was founded in 2020 at the height of COVID when me, like many other people, were stuck at home doing the thing that we used to love doing, which was gaming. And as it said in my little bio there, I had my son there and I couldn't help but sit and think, how is there no house league for video games? It's the same as every other sport that I played growing up, yet we just let 12 year olds play with 30 year olds and see what happens. That's fine with me. But anyway, we're going to dive into a little bit of this. So I wanted to start with a history of Let's Go Gaming. As I mentioned, we were formed in 2020, so COVID and all that fun stuff, which we all got to experience. But needless to say, we wanted to create a safe space gaming environment for our players. And what we did was we partnered up with one of our minor hockey associations, local to us, and we started running NHL tournaments for all the players that couldn't currently play hockey. Um, but in order to actually engage with all of those players and make it so that the parents themselves could actually watch what they were doing, because that's really what we wanted to do was get the parents involved with their kids gaming habits. We needed a place to host it and that would let what uh, words that's what led us to building a virtual stadium which i will dive into what that looked like a little in a little bit um, but in order to run the stream itself we needed a well we needed all the equipment ready to actually run the stream but as opposed to going out and buying all the equipment necessary what we ended up finding was easylive.io which is a cloud-based production hub much like the dome truck we had outside but it's completely browser-based so anyone can log into it from their laptop anywhere and manage the stream as it's happening um words again that led us into one of our main issues we ran into when we first started out and we were getting the streams in is we were linked to our actual players internet connectivity meaning whatever little Billy had at home is what we had coming to us. So if they had two megs up, that's what we were dealing with. So our video quality definitely fluctuated, but then thankfully LiveView Incorporated ended up acquiring Easy Live, which LiveView works in bonded cellular video encoding and works with a lot of high-end production companies. Um, and once we had access to that, it stabilized our feeds and we were able to put together an end to end managed service that offered both remote connectivity for video encoding. Also live editing and switching in a cloud based format for remote services and then also distribution to all in together. So, as I was mentioning the let's go gaming virtual stadium, what was it, this was it. We put this together during COVID to actually host the Don Mills Flyers Esports Classic. It was a charity fundraiser that we put together. It ran a lot like a telethon trying to get people involved and the parents involved. We hosted a raffle for all the donations. We also gave away a PS5 to the winning kid because those were super hot items at the time. What better way to get kids to sign up? Um, what you're looking at here, we actually had independent video conferences that were at each table. So that's where the parents were able to come in and watch the show and also communicate with each other. But the cool thing was, is they were able to move from table to table so they could get a little piece of conversation, much like they'd be at a hockey rink or a baseball field and talk to the little groups of parents. Um, and in the center there on the top left of the ice surface, you see our actual live stream. That's where the content was coming in. You were able to take that full screen at any time if that's what you wanted to do. And yeah, we also sold some sponsorship and advertising to help raise funds and this was kind of the principle of what we were hoping to roll out um so in actually creating our live streams we used easy live studio which is now referred to as live view studio it's still in the transition of being called that because they were just acquired by live view very recently um Easy Live's capable of taking in a wide array of, mall, of input source types from your classic RTMP, SRT, NDI, all that fun stuff, um, and also distribute them across all major social media platforms, as well as any form of live stream that you need for uh, store and forward or post production or any of those sort of things. So, ooh, laser pointer, yeah. So you can see up here, this is the control room. This is actually Easy Live. So this is where we're in the production side of things. So this is actually all of our video input sources. So those can be coming in from a wide array of things. For us early on, we were using computers uh, programmed with OBS to just push the feeds that way. Later on, it became 
uh, live view encoders that were able to push that feed to us. And down below here in this section is actually where you're have, able to have remote guests come into Easy Live itself. So that's where our commentators were able to come in and watch our game feed as it's going in and comment over it to actually keep people engaged and that sort of thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's, bad. oh, no, I missed something. Over here, pre, pre live view down here. I don't know if this is Dinesh or Guilfoyle, aptly named from Silicon Valley. Those were our first encoding robots. Uh, that's what we call them. At the end of the day, they were two mini computers crammed into a box. One was strapped to a camera for actual player footage and the other was strapped to a HDMI line splitter. So whichever gamer was using it in their home, they were able to plug in PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo, whatever, into our device and then just right into their TV so that we could manage the stream itself. We uploaded TeamViewer onto both of them so I could just remote access into them, turn them all on and not have to worry about, you know, an 11, 12 year old trying to figure out how to run this OBS thing. Um, so that was, that was a good time. But as I said, we were limited to the internet that the kids could provide to us, which would affect our actual gameplay feeds, which you may notice in this short video of what the Don Mills Flyers Esports Classic was all about and our vision of House League Esports as, it, as we saw it. That was it. This was the promotion coming out of COVID. We're like, we're going to do this thing. As much as I'd love to say, we immediately did that thing. Parents aren't necessarily ready to pay for their kids to play more video games. So I'm waiting for more parents like this guy that totally get it and would totally volunteer to be a coach. And we need people who are coming up to be referees and build that infrastructure out. At this time, I was actually a co-host with my brother, as you saw us acting like idiots and losing our minds for the kids, but we were very into it by the end of it. I will have you know, it was a very long day and it was super fun. Um, but that being said, yeah, I was trying to coordinate all the players to actually be in the tournament while also live editing all of our content feeds on Easy Live and coordinating with my brother to make sure that we didn't say anything stupid. So that was, that was a good time for sure, but that's what COVID was all about. So needless to say, as you saw in our presentation there, I like cringed at Rocket League because our video quality always fluctuated due to where we could actually get our sources. But in comes Live View Incorporated, which purchased or acquired rather Easy Live Studio, now Live View Studio. Um, Live View works based on bonded cellular encoding, which for anyone who doesn't know, you can take uh, a number of SIM cards, typically from other carriers, cram them into the same box, access any of the Wi-Fi around you or a possible hard line and you mesh them together to create a more stable internet feed and when they're actually encoding the encoders themselves break apart the video uh, and send it to the actual servers themselves where it gets put back together this keeps them very high quality and low latency and that's something that live view is so good at that they're across a lot of large um, broadcast platforms CBC I believe uses them TSN a bunch of people have live view infrastructure somewhere within their actual broadcast network. It's usually a side tool to whatever it is they're doing on premises or off premises. Um, but for us, that just meant reliable internet in the kids' homes, which was a big deal for us so that we could actually up our quality because if we're gonna do this thing for the long term, we need to make sure that we have good quality because gamers care about quality. <laughs> uh, moving along, if, if some of our, the live view encoder family, Put up some technical specs for anyone who's like, yeah, technical specs. 
Um, for me, I just want to make sure that they work. And that's a big part of what we're doing. For us, we have four LU300s and an LU810, meaning that we have, we're capable of running a four, a four feed Remy solution at any time. And that's something that we moved into when we realized that our esports workflow that we created all of our live productions for would work for any wide variety of different productions. So that's where we found ourselves now is a bit of a SaaS model, a software as a service where we're offering an end to end service of video content capture, remote transmission to a cloud switcher and distribution to all forms of social media and other form of live sources for whatever it is our clients may need. Sometimes they just need a live view short term rental because we brokered a deal where we're able to do it by the day and that's a very cost effective way to work with your productions because a lot of the time in starting out, especially as a freelance producer or anything like that. Your costs per gig is a big investment and you don't always have the money to invest into a wide array of different tech that you're going to need to do that. And that's where we're helping to offset those costs by offering a daily rate of both the live view rental and cloud based switching if necessary for our clients. Um, so with that, um, I was just going to say this is where we can kill the audio because I'm just going to talk over it a friend of mine was doing this for me. But this is yeah going back to the easy live now live view studio control room um, here we have our basic production setup. This is a recreation of our esports classic that we ran. Um, as you can see, we have three different layers. It runs very similar to Photoshop, where you can be compiling your scenes on top of each other. We have our logo off to the bottom right that hangs out there most of the time, lower thirds that are completely customizable. In this circumstance, we just have it up for our intro slate. So this was just waiting for the stream to start. We had some music in the background going. And at the bottom there, you can see all of our contents from our gameplay feed, which I only put up one for this demonstration, but you can have up to eight. Um, and then you can also stack servers within themselves. So if you needed more than eight, you can have a separate server that's loading into this server. Now you have 16 and so on and so on and so on. So with this, this was our main view angle. Um, and it's run through a template that's within Easy Live itself, where you're able to compile all of your feeds together to actually run the stream and they're constantly upgrading their services and adding new tools to it. So there's a lot of video transitions that are preloaded into it. Um, the basic templates, which we'll get into, into here actually in just a second, once they click the pencil in a second. <laughs> no, but so this is the template where we have two remote guests, which is myself and my brother for this specific tournament and the game feed, which you can now see up here, where there's a preloaded template within Live View Studio, where the background is the game itself. And then in the top right and left, we have our two hosts that we're able to talk through it. Um, as you look off to the left, there's a lot of other tools there. You have recording and clipping, where you're able to go and take a live edit of the actual stream itself, which can be forwarded to social media platforms for a quick promotion midstream or to be stored forward. You can also uh, upload pre-recorded content. In this case, we had some promotional video for the charity we were working with, um, but you can upload any wide variety of any preloaded content, i.e. advertising and sponsorship information for your stream itself. Um, outside, of, outside of that, down you have your remote guests as well, where you're able to manage what all of those guests are able to see and communicate with your team. So we used it both as a backend communication hub because we are all working remotely, but you can also use it for your VIP guests or present or big speakers that you're having to come in to speak at your event. Um, you can also run a mobile feed so you can send invites to your phone. So now you're able to do a very live remote shoot of anything as it comes up live. I like to think of it, it's kind of like video radio. You're just kind of there and being able to do it. And I may be wrong on that. So don't quote me on the radio thing. So I may not know what I'm talking about, but that's okay. Um, let me think. I may have breezed through that a little bit quickly, but that is pretty much all I have to say about that. So that's all right. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah. Okay. No, no, that's good. Okay.
Okay, next up is uh, Sayol uh, Gaptu. He's CTO of Waveform. Uh, passionately focused on leading the innovative gaming content for the very young age. So Salil uh, handles broadcasts and technologies from the top to the bottom, regularly stepping on show call roles for top broadcasters in and out of esports. Now, there is a special way to, uh, and uh, esports can be capitalized the S and cannot and may not be but in this situation I learned something that it can be lowercase. Uh, Sahil immerses himself in the product constantly researching and developing new technologies has kept him at the forefront of my feeding back here Peter uh, of physical and digital esports experiences. I welcome Sahil up. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tony. Nice to meet you, everybody. Uh, apologies, I am a little under the weather. If I start rambling, uh, just yell at me. Um, but thanks for having me. Uh, this is my first time presenting at the Toronto chapter, so excited about that. And uh, I'm going to be talking about game APIs, machine vision, uh, why developers just don't do their job sometimes, and uh, things of that nature. To start, has anyone here ever played a video game? Yeah? Okay, people who don't have your hand up, you do realize phone games count. Unfortunately, they count for me. <laughs> um, so a bit about me. Uh, I'm the CTO of Waveform Entertainment. Uh, I've started off from a very young age doing theater production. That later grew into doing commentary from my bedroom back in like 2007, 2008. As I played a lot of Brood War, I wanted to get really good, and I ended up giving myself Carpal Tunnel because of it. But I was like, hey, I still know stuff about this game. Let me figure out you know, how I can still be involved. Um, so that will, that's led me to the commentary. From there, uh, using my theater experience and picking up video and audio along the way, did a lot of technical production and uh, multicam direction. Um, over here, I have a long list of various shows I've done. Some of them you may have heard them. Some of them you may have not. But basically, I've done small local shows here in Toronto out of video game stores to some of the biggest arena shows in the esports space. Uh, one of the biggest things about esports is that there's a lot going on, sometimes too much. It can get a little confusing. So what we try to do, uh, especially at Waveform, is we try to make sure we're controlling everything in sync all at the same time, uh, as also, since there is so much going on uh, and the fans are very rabid, if you mess something up, they yell at you sometimes hundreds of thousands of people yelling at you in Twitch chat. And it's a, a little frightening. So to try and prevent that, um, we tap into as many of the different APIs and technologies we have uh, as being digital video games to allow us to time everything all together um, and that all the cues go out at the same time to create a cohesive experience. As if you're uh, watching like a Counter-Strike show, for example, when the bomb goes off in the game because it's a search and destroy mode, Someone plants a bomb, you want to defuse it, or the bomb explodes so that the people who planted it win the round. When that bomb explodes, oftentimes there's a lighting cue, there's a sound effect, there's graphics that gotta go off all at the same time. So instead of having a bunch of different operators all hitting those buttons at the same time and being slightly off or sometimes falling asleep at the wheel, what we can do is we can automate all of it to listen to what we like to call a game state API, which exists natively in the game. Uh, with that, all the cues can happen all at once. They're all automated. They'll always be on time and within you know, five to six frames at 60 FPS buffer um, at absolute worst. Usually it's within one 60 FPS frame that we're able to then push all those triggers out. This also means that all the data is received the same everywhere um, as sometimes you can end up if you have it on manual operators, that they'll accidentally push the wrong button. So having like team two win graphic instead of the team one win graphic uh, can be you know, a little embarrassing. And again, get a lot of people yelling at you and saying mean things that you really don't wanna hear. Um, so again, by using automation and centralized data, we can control everything in sync and uh, avoid any mishaps. One of the big things for my, uh, guiding light, I suppose, is that we want to use automation as a tool and not as the end-all be-all. 
with a lot of these things being uh, IP or HTTP controllable, it means that you can share a lot of cabling, you can ex reuse existing patch infrastructure, you can access everything remotely on the internet, lots of pros. But especially in esports, since it's a lot of tournaments, we're still trying to paint a narrative here. You know, you don't want to be using the automation as a way to cut the human factor out of it out, uh, as that would be bad. You know, it's people playing on a stage, showing their emotion, and so sometimes you need to react to that in real time to be able to help paint their narrative better. And such, it's important that the automation is simply a tool and not the end all be all for your show, as otherwise, you know, you can end up in a situation where something really cool happens or a player pops off really hard and you've now missed that moment, which would be terrible. Uh, so it's very important for us to make sure it's not sticking us into something too, too difficult. So I've got a couple of real world examples I'd like to talk about. The first one up, uh, and this is one of the, the bigger ones, uh, is the WSG NA finals we did in 2019. Was World Gaming, rest in peace, we'll never hear from them ever again, but that's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. Uh, the WSG NA finals, basically we had five different game, or four different games, but five different tournaments. It was the US versus Canada finals for every single game. Uh, there was Counter-Strike Co-Ed, Counter-Strike Women's, PS, StarCraft 2, and Dota 2. Some of these games did have game state APIs, some of them didn't, uh, and I'll, more on that later. Basically, in our studio in Montreal, we put on all of these shows all at once, flipping through every single game with very little breaks over the course of two days. And so, for the games that did have game state APIs, we wanted to use that. One of the easiest examples, which if you've watched any esports, and if you have bad taste, you've probably watched League of Legends, you've seen something similar to this, which is called a draft UI. Um, for Dota 2, we can tap into the game state API here and actually show what's going on in real time as the draft in a Team RTS style of game, Dota, League of Legends, anything else that's worse than League of Legends somehow. Uh, they'll have the players picking their heroes, but also banning some heroes at the same time. And this happens before the game starts. It's very boring. It takes like 10 minutes and you just kind of talk for a very long time. And also most of the games don't really look very good when you're doing this. In fact, they look bad. So we have to use the API to try and make something that looks a little bit nicer and lets us work through it a bit better from a broadcast perspective. Uh, in the esports space, we've kind of gone with rebuilding it as a lower third, which is quite nice because then you can cut cameras underneath it. You can go back to your talent. You can show another full screen graphic underneath it too if you wanted to. But all of this is linked up uh, over HTTP and JSON direct to a game spectator client that's running in real time with the players. And then as a player picks a hero, uh, we can see the current selection state over here for NA's finest. They're on hero four. They're about to pick that, so it's lit up red. And then once they pick, it switches to whatever hero they pick. Uh, and then the next phase moves onwards. Doing stuff like this gets a little difficult because sometimes the game developers change how the draft actually operates. Um, so one of the best things that we did for Team RTS games is we realized instead of trying to understand how the draft works and rebuild that automation track ourselves, all we did is we placed the assets and we're listening to the game to listen to what phase to occur. Um, as with Dota, for example, right before the show, actually, they had changed how the drafts worked. Before this, you had four bands, I think, and it went team one for two, team two for two, team one for one, and something like that. And then they changed it to be six hero ban. So what we did is instead of having our set automation track we had before, because we were like, oh, Dota won't change the draft. Why would that ever happen? We then made it just listen to say, all right, it is on phase ban underscore team underscore number. Just do that. Um, and this allowed us to be a lot more flexible and then also made it easier for us to port this over to other games if necessary. But then also it just meant that we didn't have to waste so much time recoding it because Dota then changed the draft method like three other times since then. So it was actually a good idea. One of the other things we had going on uh, at this show was Counter-Strike, like I mentioned. Counter-Strike I think is the epitome of game state APIs and it's where a lot of the work in game state APIs has come from, in fact. Valve has actually been quite nice 
And while they don't really do a very good job at their esports scene and like taking care of it, they do at least make it a nice job for uh, broadcast developers, which is very helpful. Um, CS has the most data out of any game in real time that you can log out. You can save it to a server database automatically because the game runs on dedicated servers. And so we tap into that quite a lot when we're working on Counter-Strike. What you're looking at here is actually the game being rendered in real time, but every UI element, except for the minimap here, is done as a graphical overlay from us. The minimap, we have now since actually made our own radar, so that way we can make it look a lot nicer and add more features to it. Um, but the main benefit of this is one, we can skin it to look however we want, so we can make it look more like the brand that of the tournament or the brand of a sponsor. Uh, we can move stuff around very easily. We can animate things differently. And we can also add features to it. For example, over here on the left, you see the second and third, pl uh, fourth player there. Uh, their player bar is white. The reason for that is because in Counter-Strike, you can throw a flashbang grenade. Uh, I'm sure flashbang grenade is pretty self-explanatory. You get hit by it. You can't see or hear anything for a little while. In the original Counter-Strike HUD that comes in the game, you can't actually tell who gets flashbanged very easily. So what we did in our HUD is that we flash out the entire player bar for however long and for the strength of however they get flashed. So if a player is standing right next to, next to the flashbang because they suck at the game and they're just like, oh, what's that? It's pure white for five seconds. If they're smart and they're like, oh crap, and turn around, then it'll only be flashed about 50% of the player bar uh, and also only for like a half second. Again, that's one of those things where instead of creating a set automation track, we just have it reflect the actual state that it is in the game, make, making us not have to worry too much about incorrectly calculating something or hitting an edge case or if a player pauses partway through a flash. All we're doing is just replicating the exact state that the game is producing. And with Counter-Strike, we're blessed with the fact that they actually can give us the entire game state 60 times a second, uh, which is exactly what we need. On top of that, we can add more features by adding personality of the player. Over here in the center, we can have the actual player picture next to whatever player we're actively observing. We can add in different cameras however we want. More recently as well too, we've actually added the ability to check the round history. So when I mentioned being able to get data in real time or log to a database, we can listen to that data looking back. And in Counter-Strike, you normally play about 30 rounds, as it says on the top. We can pull out another graphic at the touch of a button that the observer, who is the person operating the Counter-Strike spectator client, they can hit that button and it'll pull out a graphic that says round one, this team won by this. Round two, this team won by that. And we're able to put all of that into one simply neat little HTML file that just gets run on the computer. And even more to the benefit of that is we can give the observers more information that they need than the broadcast because we can give them a separate HUD than what the broadcast actually sees just by doing two different display outputs out of the computer. Now, sometimes game devs don't care about esports, they don't care about broadcasts, they just want to make a cool game, which, to be fair, that's kind of the goal, so I don't blame them. But in also, sometimes you're on a console, and uh, it's very difficult to extract data out of a console compared to a computer, whereas Dota, StarCraft, Counter-Strike, all of those games, they're just on a PC, you can do whatever you want, you can memory scrape, you can do stuff that would probably get you banned, but that's up to you. On a PlayStation, however, like for the Mortal Kombat Finals back in 2020, all we have is an HDMI out. We can't get any data out of it. Uh, and especially for Mortal Kombat 11, they didn't build any way of getting data extracted in real time. So this is where we had to put our heads together and uh, come up with some creative ideas. What we did is that we created a machine vision API system to basically give us the same data we would have gotten out of a Counter-Strike or a Dota or a Rocket League. But we built it ourselves with a five frame buffer as a fighting games have a lot of peculiar traits, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But this allowed us to do a lot of real-time statistics. This allowed us to do live triggers, just like Counter-Strike. This allowed us to have live graphics on LED walls, just like Counter-Strike or Dota, et cetera, um, all just by pulling the feet of the game. So what you're looking at here uh, is a picture from the event. Is this the, yeah. So on the front of the LED wall here, we've got 
two health bars and two little dots, and that's being replicated in real time from the game that you're seeing up there. And this was surprisingly difficult because in fighting games, we realized very early on that uh, you can jump in front of your health bar and machines aren't very smart. You have to teach them how to see. Um, so we went through about a two month process on this on how to actually get a computer to make the same realizations a person would. If I am in, sent in front of the screen, you all have object permits. You can understand there's something behind the screen, or I guess technically it's a projector. You see it on my chest right now. It pr pretend this is a TV and it's behind me on that screen. It doesn't just go away, but you understand the content's being blocked. You'll come back to it later. If I walk away, you're like, oh, I can see again. I'll start paying attention. For a computer, it doesn't do that. So in Mortal Kombat, when someone jumps in front of the health bar, the computer freaks the and that's a problem. So for us, we added a five frame buffer because we realized you can't actually be in front of the health bar for more than four frames. This gives us one frame of lenience where if it doesn't know what the hell's going on, it's just gonna chill for like five frames and then it'll go back to doing what it's doing. And we did that at first for the whole screen, but that caused some more problems because sometimes you jump only in front of one side and not the other. So players two health can still be going down because if, Garros jumps up and does a grounded sand attack from the air. He's in front of his own health bar, but he's still hitting the scorpion on the other side of the screen and that health bar is going down. So then we had to go back and we made it by element. The different elements we had were each individual player's health bar, the attack and defense meters on the bottom, and then it's a little hard to see, but there's a fatal blow underneath the health bars. And this allowed us to then get really good accuracy real-time, basically, information out of the game. Uh, and what this allowed us to do, we could show the health bars, round wins. Um, we had automated triggers. So on the sides screens here, if someone lost the round, the picture would go gray for like seven seconds, and the winner would have like a happier picture pop up for seven seconds, and then it would go back. Um, when someone won the whole match, a lighting trigger would go off, there would be some graphics all sorts of that stuff, just like we do in Counter-Strike, Dota, and Rocket League. But this time we had to do all that hard work to get that information ourselves. And it was quite the journey to realize that game devs really don't document anything, which is very annoying, but we can get around it. And speaking of not documenting anything, uh, to their own fault, Activision Blizzard really doesn't do it. World of Warcraft is a game that doesn't really come to mind when you think of esports, but we do one of the I guess only, or there's two main modes in World of Warcraft. There's the PVE mode or player versus everyone mode uh, where you do raid content. There's a bunch of bosses in a dungeon. You gotta go through and beat all those bosses. And then, or you can do arena where you actually fight other versus other players, hence P versus, PVP. In the race to world first, it's the PVE content. Different guilds across the world are all racing to try and finish the newest raid all at once. And it's a little convoluted because there's no spectator mode. So we have to capture 20 different players' feeds on site. And on top of that, there's no API. And on top of that, there's, it's Activision Blizzard, so they change stuff all the time. And on top of that, on top of that, like they just really don't make it easy to broadcast. We've done five of these now. Oh, also, by the way, it's a 24 seven show and it lasts like two weeks. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it lasts four weeks, like the one in March. Well, we find out when we get there. So as part of that, running a 24-7 show with players' UIs being changed all over the place, uh, we had to come up with a system that allowed us to automate this as much as we can while still allowing us to paint a narrative, like I mentioned. We created our machine vision system, Suzume, for this. And basically what it does, similar as the Mortal Kombat one, we pull in one of the player feeds, we get the data out of that using machine vision, create a bunch of edge cases to work around, and then we can display that back as graphics in real time. And this is very important because if you're looking at this, this is probably very confusing to most of you unless you've played WoW. There's a lot going on in that player's feed over there. So what we want to do is we want to be able to break it down into the important parts for the viewers, both veteran and new, so that way we can show the important information much easier to see. Over here on the left, you've got the raid frames. Down across the bottom, this blue bar is the boss's health in basically real time. Uh, on the right over there, you've got battle reses, which is basically how many times they can resurrect one of their teammates. 
You've got Bloodlust, which is basically a group-wide buff that lets them all be a lot stronger for a little bit of time. You've got the Encounter Timer, how long they've been in the fight. This is their best percent, how far they've gotten into the boss's health, the current health again, and the number of times that they've tried attacking this boss. On the bottom, you've got the different phases. So at each phase, there's different mechanics of the boss. So in the first phase of a boss, you might have to run away from a red line. In the second phase of the boss, you might have to run away from a flying meteor, stuff like that. And instead of having to input all that information manually, we pull one of the player's feeds to get information off of his UI, and then scrape that data and display it back, uh, sending it over WebSockets to get it as real time as possible into the actual broadcast graphics. Um, over on the left here, you'll see we've got the raid frames, which is helpful because sometimes the players put it too close to their chat. The real reason there's a camera down here is because they have a chat there and they say some very bad things, so we can't show that on stream. But then you get half of the bottom row covered up, but luckily for us, we can actually just show what that bottom row is using the machine vision software. The one good thing World of Warcraft did is that you can actually program your own UI. So most of what you're looking at here is all custom code. It's Lewis scripting that the players can do, uh, and there's usually like one or two guys that sit in dark corner, and all they do is they program what's called weak auras, which is all these different UI elements for the players during the race. Um, so what we did is we basically created like a 100 by 200 pixel set of pixels that gave us all the information we needed for the boss. Um, these different players to get their class, which is what all the different colors represent. We have one pixel that's just 20 pixels across with all the classes in a row. Then to get the health of each player, there's another row below that with the luminosity for each person. And using that luminosity, inverting that, we can say, okay, out of 100%, what health are they? And then display that as a colored block. Um, for the health bar of the boss, we actually just have a 1,000 pixel bar at the bottom of the screen. Read that. For battle reses, um, we have a five, I think. Yeah, five pixel wide block. Lights up one, two, three, four, five for how many battle reses they have. Uh, Bloodlust, same thing. And then encounter timer is just whenever the pull starts, which again, just displays a pixel, we start counting up from there. And uh, once no one's alive in the raid, we stop the encounter timer there. And this is one of the craziest examples of what we have to do because, again, it goes for 24-7. And also, since Blizzard changes so much stuff, we have had to make tons of updates during Raiders to World First live on the fly to try and match the Blizzard's buffs and nerfs to various bosses as we go along. Um, but it's very helpful because when we first started doing Race to World First, we had no idea how we were even going to tackle all of this. There's only the third uh, raid tier, so the third Race to World First we did, uh, that we started having all this machine vision stuff. And those first two, it was very difficult for even us to follow along what was going on. So, you know, we take these problems that we find uh, as viewers, as fans, um, as various esports players ourselves, and try to solve them with software, machine vision, API, et cetera, to try and make it easier for the viewer. Because we know a lot of us at Waveform, we're just fans of the games that we play. So if we can solve the problems for ourselves, we'll be solving it for those 100,000 people at Twitch chat. So instead of yelling at us, they're like, oh, wow, thanks. That's it for me. Thank all of you uh, for listening. And I'll give it back to Tony. A certificate for you. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. So. Our virtual crowd is very intense. They're really focused. They got a message saying that that was the first F-bomb on our SIMTI meeting. So congratulations. <laughs> OK, before I ask Mary Ellen to come up, uh, I just want to take a couple of minutes and show the virtual crowd because they didn't get to uh, see the truck. Peter, can you put up the first slide? I just took a couple of pictures and just going to show them what it is that uh, you guys got to see here. What I didn't realize is there's a generator. I didn't realize I didn't take the picture, but there's a generator back there that's powering the truck. All the trucks have, or mobiles, have names. This is Pioneer. I'm not sure if you knew that. The one that I was on was Big Mo. Um, uh, so camera out front. 
door here leads to uh, one end of the production room, air conditioner, exhaust, another door for the other production area. Next one, Peter. So this here is the control room. You can see there's multi-viewers, three desks, uh, TD at the very, very begin end here. Looks very complicated, but it's a bunch of buttons that are repeat. Uh, next one, Peter. And this is the EVS station and the producer's desk behind for slow motion replays. Uh, next, Peter. Uh, this is the CCU area. Uh, two, four, six, and three is nine cameras. Uh, next. Uh, another shot on the uh, CCUs and a couple more EVS stations. Next. This is the audio control room, which was at the back of the truck. All its support gear. Tape on the phone so it doesn't fall off as it's running down the road. So, uh, yeah. I think that's it, or is there a couple more? Or are there a couple of repeats? Again, another uh, one for the uh, control room. Um, how many people can... Uh, uh, operators are in the truck in this but the pioneer no that's for uh, a dome question how many operators in the truck Mike got to be like 12 what's that 18 okay so 18 people just in that truck alone and all the support trucks uh, that uh, takes on a hockey game, soccer game, things of that nature. So, okay, so next up is Mary Ellen Karlov. Uh, Mary Ellen is, C uh, sorry, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Dome Production since 2004. Uh, she leads the dome integration of mobile productions, host broadcast services, master control, crewing, transmission services. She is the first Canadian female inducted. And yes, first Canadian. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh, in the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame in 2019. Way to go. So... I just need a couple of minutes here to change the computer because it didn't want to marry to ours, but that's okay. There you go. Uh, uh, left and right, so forward, backwards. Yeah. Did I uh, do that right? Did it go forward? Yep. yep. Do you want to use yeah, podium? Mic? Okay, cool. I'm not, I'm not as... Uh running around. <laughs> well, thank you uh, all for uh, coming and uh, also for inviting me back. I think the last time I was here, we were talking about uh, Amazon and the streaming companies buying sports rights. And so far, Amazon's in the business and Apple's in the business. Uh, I also think I didn't, I said I didn't know what was going on in 2020. So I guess uh, we all found out what that happened. In terms of um, COVID, uh, one of the things that it's done for Dome Productions is uh, different workflows. So um, 2019, we were doing some Remy's, which uh, bringing the cameras back to the um, studio, and we were doing some full up tr uh, trucks. But as a result of COVID, uh, we've changed uh, many, many workflows. So as we know, March 11th, 2020, at 1226, the World uh, Health Organization deemed COVID an epidemic and a pandemic. The crew that I was hanging out with were at the Sportsnet Grar Grill at the Sky Dome. And at 826, the two coaches were brought to the center by the officials and told that uh, the Utah Jazz Center tested positive. And 33 minutes later, they suspend suspended the uh, season. Um, sorry. One, one by one, um, our schedules were canceled. 
uh, hockey was canceled. Um, we had some esports that was canceled. And three days later, our whole schedule was gone. No more events for Dome Productions. We were at the same time on March 13th, we were building a um, studio in uh, the CBS building in New York City for the NBA 2K season. And we were told that we were shut down because there was a COVID case in the building. Uh, less than six weeks later, the Dome engineering team got together and they came up with a truly innovative solution and allowed us to salvage the remainder of the season. Our technical team, which was our engineering group, our EVS operators, our technical directors, our audio operators were in Toronto. Our producers were in Vancouver. Our teams and same problems we had with the internet at all the homes. We built kits, we, gave, we did YouTube videos on how to connect all the connectivity. And um, our announcers were in different uh, cities in the US. The engineers had to figure out latency, how to bring all the feeds together and how to bring the game feeds from all of the different players into the dome as well. Uh, at one point in time, we lost uh, one of the announcers and we thought we had an issue with um, our feeds coming into the building. Believe it or not, um, a tornado had hit through his town and he was underneath the, um, his table and then up he came and he was called the game. There is no traditional sports being aired on any linear television. It was the first time that the NBA 2K was aired on linear television, Sportsnet and ESPN. So we had to figure out how to get those feeds back to them as well. One thing that um, we struggled with as a organization in an industry is when the pandemic hit, it caused the sports world to grind to a halt. And we had to come up with some solutions on how are we gonna bring back sports so that we can do it in a safe, safe space. Um, we were fortunate enough to be a part of a team that uh, included um, European broadcasters, OV van vendors, um, American, let's see, it's American broadcasters, producers, um, Dome Productions was involved, NEP was involved, Game Creek were all mobile vendors, and we figured out um, how to get back together. We called us, ourselves the Clean Freaks. We met once a week, uh, all virtual, and um, we said we have to be able to do sports, we have to protect the players, we have to protect the announcers, and we have to protect the operators. So we broke up into many groups and we um, went away, we had social distancing policies, cleaning policies, and the big thing that came out of that was called the bubble. Um, not only did we do sports in the bubble, i.e. Um, in stadiums without fans, each um, uh, area of the production was in a, bu a bubble. So the people on the top, we had players and uh, league as well as audio assistants and announcers they were in one bubble so they couldn't venture out into anywhere else other than those people we had um, camera operators and tvas that were in the arenas they were not allowed near the trucks they couldn't cross and we had an inside the truck bubble and we had an outside the truck bubble the outside the truck bubble made sure all the equipment was cleaned and it passed over that um, border and when the equipment came back, it was cleaned and then brought back to the truck. I don't think we could have been safe without having these um, policies and procedures from the Clean Freaks group. The first bubble that we did was the NHL bubble. Um, at first, uh, we got many calls from the NHLs of whether our trucks could cross the border and uh, some reason they came back and they did it all in Canada. Um, Dome teamed up with Sportsnet. Dome was the technical facility. Sportsnet was the production facilities. And um, NEP out of Pittsburgh it was the facilities and MB Sport, NBC Sports was the production group. We, uh, Dome Productions was out of the Rogers Center. Oh, sorry, the Rogers. Uh, what it's Rogers place so you they get them all confused and of course the NBC was in Toronto at the um 
Air Canada Centre, Scotiabank Arena now. Um, so the deal was that they had to produce a game, they had to have similar broadcast templates that included more than 30 cameras. They had specialty cameras such as a JITICAM, which is basically a jib up, upside down. All things that they wouldn't have had if there was um, audiences. They considered a made for television movie of how they did hockey and they pumped artificial audiences in and um, so they were responsible both NBC sports and Sportsnet to create a production feed that could be shared by both so NBC could pick up the Rogers um, place feed Sportsnet could pick up the Scotia bank feed and if there was a regional television um, that had the broadcast rights they also had to feed it to them had to be neutral in terms of the bias biases between the teams and we staged 130 games in 59 days. The next, uh, we didn't do the uh, NBA bubble. They chose to do it all in the United States and everybody went together. But then uh, they wanted to start their 2020-21 season. And uh, unfortunately, um, at the timing, the COVID uh, um, cases were hitting an unexpected high. The Canadian government was very concerned about letting people into the country and the Raptors were denied the request to play at home. The Raptors, um, very, very short timing, um, built a um, floor and put it into the Amelie uh, uh, Arena in Florida and we did all of our home games for the Toronto Raptors there as a Remy style. So basically, we had, as you can see here, we had, would have a truck on site in Tampa and it had camera signals, the audio um, commentators actually were in Toronto, they weren't allowed to go into Florida, intercom tally and clock data. We had eight cameras, 1080p cameras, and they came from uh, the Florida arena, they went into the NBA in Secaucus, they then came into the Scotiabank arena went from the Scotiabank Arena about 40 miles um, into our parking lot at our Oakville warehouse where we had set up a um, truck for the actual production. We had a studio out there for the commentators, again, social distancing with the bubbles. The commentators on one side, they did their own makeup, they had their own washrooms while the technical were on the other side. And then from there, we had to bring it into the broadcaster. Sometimes it was TSN, sometimes it was Sportsnet, and they would have to have feeds going back from our Oakville um, parking lot, as well as all the feeds went back to the um, arena in Florida. Next, the Toronto Blue Jays, they wanted to do something. Again, we could not um, be on site, um, but what we, and I would say it was more Major League Baseball, they were saying they want to get away from the bubble and they left it with all of these sports net um, type companies or the regional broadcasters to do whatever they wanted to do in terms of their broadcast. Um, so they all just said they want to go back to the home truck, they want to have a truck on site, uh, they want full up production on site. So under the league's initiative, um, the RSNs um, of each location, so the Yankees or um, the Boston Red Sox or the Toronto Blue Jays in Buffalo, they had to produce um, a clean world feed broadcast, again, unbiased, 50-50, and um, they had to also have commentators narrating what was going on. The home broadcaster was responsible to distribute the feed to the away RSN. So if the Toronto Blue Jays played the Boston Red Sox, they had to send that feed to Nesson. Or if it was ESPN, they had to send it to the national broadcaster where they put its own graphics commentaries as well as some studio content and commercials on at home. In addition to the clean feed, um, as we developed um, and got our stuff together, we, we offered up one or two dedicated cameras to the away team and they were able to customize the broadcast. 
artificial crowd noise was pumped in until they allowed fans back into the stadium. So we had uh, one more uh, bubble. Um, they wanted to bring curling into Canada. Uh, so we actually did a curling bubble, which I would say was the last of the pandemic. Um, we started a bubble in February and we were there until early May. You can see the different um, events that we started with the Scotties, went to the Briar and went to the mixed doubles. Then we did the world men's and then Sportsnet TSN left the bubble. Sportsnet came into the bubble and we did two um, pinties of the Grand Slam at curling. And then again, as the pandemic went on, they decided to do the women's curling as well, which was, I believe was supposed to be in Switzerland that year. Uh, the curling bubble was rough to, for um, our team. A uh, lot of people got COVID and I would say um, we were 48 days in the bubble and um, took a real toll on the mental health of um, our freelancers. So as a leader, you're now learning, uh, you're dealing with mental health issues, COVID issues, and you really can't put anybody in the bubble to fulfill those um, crews so now you're limiting your coverage. So I just put this up um, as a world feed. So the, the model that was done with the Toronto Blue Jays, the NBA and the NHL decided this is what they wanted to do. They wanted to take on the world feed. So again, we had to pivot and um, in all of our six venues across uh, Canada, we had to put trucks the truck was the home team, so the Toronto Maple Leafs would have a truck. We had to add into that truck two extra cameras, a router feed. Sometimes the announcers were on site. Sometimes the announcers weren't on site. That would come into a transmission kit that we um, built prior to the season. And they would um, bring back, I think it was five or six feeds. So. Sportsnet would do the home show that would go straight to Sportsnet. They would take um, the six feeds and we would send that back to if they were playing like the Montreal Canadiens. The next um, thing after that, so we did world feeds um, for that whole season. We did Remy's, we did um, full up productions, but then the uh, regional sports nets again came to the table, went to the um, NBA, and they went to um, the NHL. And they wanted to, although they liked the savings of the costs of the world feeds, they didn't like the quality of the production. There was latency issues. Sometimes they got their intercom. Sometimes they got their tally. So they, working with the other mobile companies and the actual regional sports nets. We've come up with a situation, Dome calls it Remco, which is a remote control production. Game Creek, which is a competitor in the United States, calls it Game Creek Anywhere. NBC, the regional sports net, calls it Raps. And Bally calls it Cloud Control. So you're going to hear a lot of that in the next uh, season. Um, many different names, but we're talking about the same thing. So where Remy is, um, you're doing your production off-site with cameras and audio on-site. A Remco is, your production is off-site, your graphics operator may be off-site, your EVS operator may be off-site, but your truck is on-site and the full production comes on-site. So the difference between the full up mobile, I just sort of said is that some people are off-site truck is on site and then there's a connection from the mobile and it's a data connection and we put that through our dome net fiber network the uh nice thing for the mobile company in terms of revenue generating is they still need that full up mobile on site which means the pioneer truck that was out there that's got to be there and we can actually um, make money on all the equipment not just the cameras um, all the processing power of the mobiles needed, and we're simply remoting the user interface to an offsite location. So some of the uh, systems that's needed for Remco, and I'm going to tell you, please don't ask me any questions.
systems. I got the best engineering team right down there. You can ask them any one of those questions because they were all instrumental in building this Remco out. You do need Arvon to um, properly address your intercom. You need a net network router that can provide an RIP V2, which I have no idea what it is, connection to the offsite control room. Your graphics machine, your score bug, will need to be connected to Remco network so that the production can team view into the systems. Your X file, which is uh, used on EVS, has to be connected uh, with an additional network connection for remote access, again, through TeamViewer. One of the EVS will need a KMV and a 422 extender and added to provide remote control. So what we're doing is we're actually having an EVS operator in the control room, say, in Colorado, and we have an EVS operator on the truck. Different methods um, for an Everts truck and a non-Everts truck, so we had to figure out that for all of our different trucks. And then there's an extra encoding and decoding packages, which we've located at each Canadian NHL venue and MBA facility to facilitate the transmission of the multi-viewers for productions and return feeds of producer ISO back to the talent. So what's happened now is we show up with the truck and I'm sure there's a lot of producers in the room, but the producers in Colorado want it on now, but we don't have that anymore. We used to have like two and a half hours to get the truck up and going, the production would show up. Now we're actually, as soon as we park the truck, we're asking, where's my monitor wall? Where's my EVS? Where's my uh, graphics? So again, it's, it's tough on the engineers, but um, it's working, so. If it works, they're going to keep using it. So one of the things that um, as we go into this season, it's the flavor of the day. Do you want a Remco? Do you want a, a Remy? Do you want a full up production? Do you want a world feed? Um, one thing it has done is if we have COVID issues, they can downsize really quickly from a full up production to a world feed. If they have weather issues, which we had with um, Buffalo the other um, month and our truck didn't make it to Toronto, so we quickly pivoted and did a, a Remy. Uh, the Sportsnet crew at uh, 11 o'clock at night calls from the airport and says they didn't make it to St. Louis because there's uh, uh, snow and uh, blizzard. So the next day we're doing a Remy from uh, St. Louis with a world feed. What's next on the horizon? is, um, oh, sorry, if you want to just take a look at that, that's sort of how we do the Remco. And next on the horizon for us is cloud. Although we've done cloud production um, in terms of uh, eSports, we really haven't done it in terms of sports yet. So that's uh, probably on our agenda um, this year is to take a tier three sport um, produce it in the cloud. Question is, what is that cloud? It's going to be interesting. And uh, if we can do it on an iPad, maybe one day. So that's ours. So that's it. Dom, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any questions? <laughs> I'm going to grab another mic here. Do we want to bring the people up to the front? Um, are there any questions, Julie? Uh, there's a question over there. Oh. Luke. Peter, I don't know what number that is. Uh, just a quick question for Dome. Um, just out of curiosity, are you using uh, 2110 Sempty for your signal acquisition? Yeah. Uh, between the trucks um, and uh, just kind of a question about uh, what is the biggest challenges in terms of uh, latency and stuff to overcome on uh, remote shoots that you've had to deal with. Yeah, uh, what is, it? yeah, regarding latency, uh, doing your remote shoots that you've had to run into. <laughs> yeah. 
first question you asked, which is about uh, Scooby 2110. Uh, we have taken that step into 2110. Uh, we launched uh, our first truck actually during COVID uh, times that came out in 2020. You know? It was the was the, when we launched it. We didn't have very many events to work on it, but that was actually a kind of a little bit of a blessing because it just gave us more time to work out some of the kinks that, that we experienced. So that was our first IP truck. We're now this year just coming back to build two more that would be able to maybe potentially allow us to exchange 2110 signals between trucks. But as it is now, it's pretty much an island on the one truck that we use, and then most things beyond that is is not 2110, but uh, maybe 2022 type of uh, digital. Um, transport uh, signals and then I think the second one was about you know remote challenges and and I'm not sure if I meant like signal flow or 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 just other resources Sig signal yeah yeah so uh, 2110 is a uh, pretty widely adopted now I mean it's a lot of core infrastructure but really for long haul you would use a different version of IP uh, connectivity and 2022 is the is the is the format uh, that you go but and now, of course, with the proliferation of a lot of streaming capabilities and public IP uh, delivery, uh, there's so many more options uh, for getting uh, signals uh, from a remote location. And, and the, the guys in the group have, um, have uh, really mastered that in a lot of ways because uh, all the esports stuff that you saw, like with the work that we do on Overwatch League, which includes players and people from all parts of the world, actually, um, we're using a lot of the public IP to actually uh, move those signals uh, and bring them into our facility, but not so much 2110, but other just transport delivery services and, and over public IP. So, you know, SRT delivery or RTMP, uh, lots of those kinds of uh, uh, formats and uh, solutions. Other questions? There's one there. Uh, so I have a question for uh, Dome Entertainment about, um, so Overwatch is another Blizzard game, um, and as uh, Waveform talked about, like, uh, talking about that, uh, does Overwatch have a lot of, like, API integration? Do you guys use that for your um, UI, or have you guys um, created other systems for that? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. It's an interesting question. I'm probably not the guy to answer that, uh, and I don't know if the... Uh... But also, Cole, when you should have just asked me at the summer showdown in September. Uh, so, a bit in the particulars of this, Dome helps with a lot of the engineering, but that sort of side comes from Blizzard and from like Esports Engine, formerly MLG, to do a lot of the creative on it. Um, but Overwatch's API does exist; it's very closed off. Only Overwatch League gets to use it because they actually use a custom build of the game to run the API. Um, and a lot of the systems actually kind of run like simultaneous and parallel to Dome's systems for Overwatch League, at least for getting the API around, uh, mostly because it still happens on LAN, and then they're kind of like pre-building those graphics and then cutting it up and sending it around. At least that's what we had for the Summer Showdown at the Matami. Um, but I know that like different venues, sometimes it changes as to like how that actually operates. Um, and also like when we were in OWL season one, it ran very different than how it does now. Now that we're all like Remy style on the road. Other questions? Craig? Yeah, sorry, I was just wondering, um, do the games publish guides for their APIs? Or are you just totally in the dark? Literally never. Never, okay. So are you just hitting the thing and just pushing and pulling until you get all the data back? Wow, okay. That's messy. Because <laughs> I, I have an API for my broadcast support, like broadcast playout system, and it documents every API command from start to finish, and it's all there, right? So if I want to look up something, like pull a piece of data from a thing, it's all in there, right? So, okay, that's good to know. Yeah, it would be nice. <laughs> and have you ever had a problem? Did they, do you ever have no control of whether they decide to like update a game in the middle of like a tournament or something? They just push a new version, and then it just gets automatically in there, and then they changed all the uh, headers and stuff. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry for making your arm around so much. Uh, yes, yeah, so in regards to pushing updates in the middle of a tournament, that does happen sometimes. Um, like I mentioned for Overwatch, there's like custom builds for the super secret developer run uh, events. 
but sometimes when we run a game um more on an open bracket style so like when we're running like street fighter combo breaker or something that's where it's more likely that a game will have an update like the night before or for example actually for wsg there was an update for counter-strike literally the thursday before we were supposed to do our event but we had said in the rules it was going to take place on this patch and it actually was important because they changed how money worked so like things cost different which would have then affected the api for us so in that case usually what ends up happening is we all kind of scratch our heads and figure out how to roll back to the previous version of the game so at least that way it's still held up for competitive integrity but also doesn't mess up the api too much sometimes we get unlucky and that's not really an option for example we did a vainglory tournament where they just changed literally everything uh and in that case we just kind of work overnight every night and like figure it out and do the best we can but yeah, sometimes we end up shit out of luck and just trying our best. I, I'm, I'm just giving it all for everybody, you know? I got to hit all of them at some point. Pardon? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Everything from basic to complex. No? Tony? Okay. Yes. Peter? Oh, wait. You could, oh, wait, one more. Uh, I have a question for Dome Entertainment. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of positions or what kind of people um, are needed in your uh, organization right now? What kind of people are you looking for? What kind of positions are more uh, in need in a sense? Right now, we probably have a 30% vacancy rate. So we're looking for lots of people in all areas. So um, one thing about COVID, um, again, it took about 30% uh, of the freelance market out of um, commission. So a lot of people retired. A lot of people decided that they didn't want to do the um, weekend work. So we're looking for almost everybody, video operators, engineers, uh, camera operators. Um, and I do believe that we've set up an internship program with Ryerson, and uh, I think we may have 15 to 20, which we're thrilled about. Um, we're also looking for, we have travel, we have scheduling, we have logistics in terms of uh, the warehouse, we have production managers, production coordinators, unit administrators, because we have to do all the billing. So it's um lots there's office work if for those that don't want to go outside there's warehouse work there's shipping um and a lot of it is uh, a lot of detail and then of course there's we don't do production at this point in time we are looking at getting into production but we don't hire producers and directors does that answer your question yes perfect thank you okay Do you hire old video operators and lighting directors? <laughs> just kidding. Hire the young ones, Mary Ellen. Just kidding. So, Mary Ellen, <laughs> how many how many shoot dates do you have a year? How many events do you do? So. Is that up to 21 now then? They called 20. Roberto saying 20. Um, and maybe retiring some next year. Hopefully. So if there's a takeaway here, they do over 2,500 events per year. And they got 20 trucks. They're, they're a busy place. Cool. Already. Yes, no, yep, perfect. Oh. Oh, one more, Mark. How are the students doing? Slides coming up. <laughs> <laughs> There's always an eager. Mark, you're Thank eager. you, Mark. Okay, just a couple of slides in closing. I got a half a dozen of them. Uh, tonight's meeting, every meeting we record. And it goes up to our YouTube channel. So if you want to see yourself ask the question again, you can go to the YouTube channel and see yourself. 
Uh, March is the topic, fast channels and dynamic ad insertions. It is going to be here. We don't know the date yet. Uh, April is a standards update, but I think we're moving that or changing it. NEB wrap up, that's after NEB where we get a bunch of panelists together to talk about how great NEB was. And some of the students that are on NEB too. So we'll need some students coming from from NEB to be up on the panel too. Yes, we're going to be looking for you. And uh, June is TTC 2023 and what TTC is Toronto Technical Conference where we have a two day event where we pick a title, pick a theme. Uh, it's in Ryerson here. We're not sure exactly where TMU. yet. TMU. Oh, TMU. I got a little story for you. So, no. yeah. So doing the registration side of it and printing all the badges and all that stuff. Um, Ryerson TMU Toronto Metropolitan came in seven different ways and this is students putting in the place of schooling manually so all of you are also still calling it something. <laughs> so a couple of barcodes if you want to become a SMPTE member but not for the students yeah you can. But and then there's a become a friend. So become a friend is if you're not a member, you don't want to or not at this time, you can become a friend and you will still get mailings from us as to meetings and things of that nature of what the Toronto section is doing month to month. And that's again the uh, June, we're not sure of the date, Toronto Technical Conference. Okay, now it's time to say thanks to our uh, volunteers that came and helped us out. I've got certificates for you guys. So can I get them to come up? Caitlin, Lola. And we also have um, takeaway goodie bags for you. Thank you to all of you. I gave one to Brian. I, I gave one to Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you were already here. Oh, did I do No, no, it's okay. Did you get your certificate? Thank you so much. Did you? Did you get your No, no, I have a name. Caitlin. Caitlin. There you go. Caitlin, there you go. Thank you so much. All right. Everybody got a bag? Thank you. Thank you. And I'm missing one. Oh, Taylor. No, no. You're up here. Uh, I think it's those two. Yeah. There we go. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to take Brian's sure. goodie bag I as well? I think already got one. I gave him a bag already. Brian's. Okay, cool. Not a certificate. And Reed. Do you want me to? Did Reed get gonna... one? Yes, he did. he did. Okay, and I'll give him a Are you going to thank everybody and take away, or you want me to? Yes, no, so let's, a round of applause for our volunteers, please. Yep. And we also have prizes. It's not so, over yet, giveaways. That's what's in the bags. You get a bunch of goodies. 3.0s, Ross socks. Ra I was gonna say Ross socks. If you go to NAB, you get a pair of socks too. So, these are the people that we selected randomly that are supposed to be in the house. So if your name is on this column, come forward. Scott, if you're in the house, come forward and you get a goodie bag. So the virtual crowd, we will reach out to you and we'll send them to you. We'll pass it. Oh, we'll wait till this is over. That's so, it. Anybody else? You gotta be here, right? Yeah, you have to be here. 
David and for Dan, are you here? Or Dan? They what? Okay. So is our our attendee from Newmarket here? High school. I just wanted to give him a shout out because it was either a teacher or a student coming all the way from Newmarket and he was going to get a prize or she. All right. Is there any other way you want to do this? Okay. You can no. give a, a couple more minutes. So the 106 people that signed up for free membership, we're going to send you an email because there is a procedure on how to do that. Uh, um, you got to create an account with Simpty. You got to upload your uh, student card things of that nature, and then you'll automatically be introduced to the Simpty fold. I really, really, really hope that you guys engage on that side, and then you can start feeling what it's all about, uh, um, what we get motivated on. And tomorrow you're going to get an email, everybody that attended, for completing the survey, because uh, we can't figure out what it is that we're doing right or what it is that we're doing wrong. We think we always do things right, but I think you have to tell us what it is that we're doing or what you'd like to see. What are some of the topics that you'd like to, yeah. for us to bring in? Because we're all open because we're here to educate you guys. And uh, we could do that, yeah. So we're going to so fill out the survey, we'll take your name, put them in a little bucket, and then pull them out, and then we'll ship you a goodie bag. So that's what our YouTube channel looks like, but you can see all of the videos that are up there, so you can, it's all past um, simply meetings that we've had. So if you're interested in, well, the one we talked about earlier, more threads, there's the whole stream. And there's some of our coordinates. The website is simpty.org slash sections in Toronto. And there's a URL for become a friend and our email address. That's it. Oh, thank you very much. Just one so, last time to thank. So yeah, we need to thank our presenters. So a round of applause for our presenters for coming out. And last, last but not least, the sponsors. And most importantly, all the people that showed up and the students. Thank you.